necessarily part of, of what is owed. Uh, so, so, so that is one task. Importantly, it seems to me that we have to recognize that white power, white terrorism, isn't disposed to, uh, to, to, to making reparations to Africans. Uh, they confine our entitlement just to the period of, of enslavement. They say, amongst other things, that it was too long ago, that it wasn't them, that we weren't the victims, that it was legal at the time, that they should be honored for giving it up voluntarily, all of that foolishness and more. And in consequence, none of the states or major institutions of, of the, the white world are disposed to um, offering any compensation. And it matters also that the Arab Islamic world takes a similar view, despite the fact that um, both their terrorism of us and their enslavement of us, the enslavement lasted longer than uh, did the, the Euro Christian, the one from Euro Christian and white, the white Europeans, uh, the, the, the predators from the sea, as, as um, one of our big minds called them. Um, and so importantly, the, 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 the white world and the Arab world stand in a stance of refusal. And it matters that that is their stance and that one of the things that we have to do and the key thing that we have to do is not just making a politics round the, round the demand, but actually regaining our power to, to impose reparations, to impose compensation. Um, and I'm, I'm fond of making the comparison between China and Africa. At the start of the 20th century, China was a whipping boy of, of the West, those same forces that, that enslaved us and colonized us. Um, the Chinese changed that state of affairs and they did it not by making pleas or appeals to the, to, to the West, to the colonialists, to the imperialists, to the white racists. What they did was carry out a revolution which liberated and unified themselves internally and kicked out of China both Western power as Western power and also Western power as represented in um, Chinese agencies and Chinese people within China who they kicked off, off, off mainland China. So unless we Africans do that and until we Africans have a revolution which unites and liberates Africa, I do not believe that we'll be in a position to uh, effectively impose reparations. And reparations, as we know, we can look at all of the incidents of where it's been paid. It relates either to conscience, to morality, or to power. Um, it is a fact that we Africans are organized or, or disorganized and therefore, and disunited and therefore disempowered. So we haven't mobilized ourselves to be powerful. And the, the whites, by contrast, uh, deal in nothing but power, even when they're pretending to be dealing in, in, in morality. Having said that, it takes me to the, to the point that uh, the white world has no morality other than morality as instrumentalism, where something to be used to gain advantage. So um, given that they have no moral qualms about what they did to us, uh, we can be quite certain that they will not be paying Africans reparations voluntarily. And, and so, um, the path to reparations is also um, what we need to do, which is to liberate and unify ourselves as Africans. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, Brother Papakai, yeah. could you just say a little bit on, on your approach to reparations? Okay. <clears throat> Reparation offers us the greatest opportunity for liberation if we approach it the right way. <clears throat> There's two roads to reparation. One, compensation for who has wronged us from the point of invasion, slavery, and colonialism. 
But as Brother Cecil said in his opening address, weak people can make demand and strong people. You have to empower yourself and make a demand. The other road is about what we should be doing for ourselves, and that is self-repair. Because invasion that led to conquest, that brings in slavery and leave us in colonialism. will not bend to our pleas. We have to prepare ourselves to make that demand. We have a way to say that there's a common hell belief that we are worse than me. Not true. In fact, I like the way Brother Cecil put it. He said, we're weird and wonderful. And we need to get rid of the weird bit and focus on a wonderful side. And the wonderful side is this, that as a people, we didn't just jump up. We've been on planet Earth the longest while and have laid down the basis of civilization that everybody follow and give us no credit for. And we've got to ask ourselves how it is that we find ourselves in a weak position that we're in. And it's because we're not operating out of our minds. When we were taken out of Africa, we were African. We came out with our own worldview, our own way of seeing and organizing our life within the world. But today, after some 400 years of enslavement and colonialism that follows behind that. We don't have our names. Dogs and slaves are named by the masters. Free men and women name themselves. So we must answer the question, are we a dog? Are we a slave? Because we have other people's names. No, in Nigeria, the potentially most powerful country in Africa, recognize the Nigerian state, recognize two religions, Christianity and Islam. No room for all African spiritual belief before European encroach on us. What does that say about our state of mind? China, who Brother Sess mentioned, who have organized themselves and free themselves and become one of the most dominant and soon to become the most dominant force on planet Earth. And they've done it in the twinkle of an eye. They call a summit, Africa China Summit, and 54 African head of state was at that summit, sitting down. Round the table, facing a row of Chinese. All those leaders came from so-called independent states. They probably haven't even met. They even haven't picked up the telephone and speak together, speak to each other and say, look, I'm going to this summit. What are you going to do? What are you going to say? And they face the Chinese. The Chinese one government, the Communist Party. There were no Chinese multinational companies sitting around a table. It was a Chinese state. And their policy, whether it was a five-year policy, a 50-year policy, whatever it was, they knew what they want from the Africans. And all we wanted was money alone because the loan was more favorable, so we think, than the one that the World Bank and Europe would offer. I didn't see one African leader took out a notebook and made any notes, because Ali was concerned, signed the dotted line for the loan. 
What does that say about our way of thinking? In Africa, as we speak, there are two weddings. The two people decide to get married, and there's two weddings. A traditional wedding and a white wedding. Why the hell do we want to do that? Nobody else do that. And we do that and all those level of madness because we're not operating from our own minds. So I'm saying we need to sit down together. We need to build a reparation movement. No one organization, no single groups of individuals, a single state can move this project. We have to start to build from the group bottom up. We need to educate our people what reparation is. And reparation is not about money. And just to say that, my voice is not very clear, very hoarse, and some of the words may not come out very clear. So Brother JJ is here to assist me. I want to read a little bit of what Chen Wei have to say about reparation. I've read many papers on repression, but this one speaks volume. And I'm gonna tell you where you can get your hands on it and read it in entirety. But I want Brother JJ, who's kindly come to assist yep. me. Yes, Brother Pepper Kai, we'll do that in a bit. I just want to bring in Sister Afian. She's just entered the meeting. Okay, we'll so just introduce yourself quickly and then we'll go back into the body of the conversation. Sister Afian, can you hear me? Greetings, Sister Afian. Uh, she's here. Um, Sister Afian. Okay, she's here, but she's not hearing me for some reason. I know she said she was going to mute the camera because, you know, she's coming all the way from Nigeria and we have a lot of problems sometimes with the buffering and dropping out and the signal being weak. So that's why she has muted her camera and then it will, you know, that normally helps. But she don't seem to be hearing me for the time being. So what I'll do then, uh, Brother Pepekai, if until she come, hold on, another one, Brother Glenwell has just arrived. So let me just bring him in and introduce him as well. Oh, that's, uh, no, that's, uh... <laughs> hello? Great, greetings, Sister Afian. Hello? No, she's having some problem. So, okay then, Brother Pepekai, yeah. You said you wanted to read something from Chinwaze's paper. Yeah, so if you could do that then, and then um, while I try and get Sister Afian on board. Greetings, family. I am um, greetings, everybody. Yeah, Brother DJ. Greetings. Uh, uh, I'm very happy to be able to address you all today. Um, I'm reading from uh, Reparations in a New Global Order, a comparative overview by Professor Chin Weizu. The paper was first read at the second plenary, plenary session of the first Pan-Africanist Congress Conference on uh, Reparations. That was in Nigeria in April 27th, 1993. So the part that uh, Uncle P wants me to actually read starts off with, let me begin by noting that reparation is not just about money. It is not even mostly about money. In fact, money is not even 1% of what reparation is about. Reparation is mostly about making repairs, self-made repairs on ourselves, mental repairs, psychological repairs, cultural repairs, organizational repairs, social repairs, institutional repairs, technological repairs, economic repairs, political repairs, educational repairs, repairs of every type that we need in order to recreate and sustain. Uh, yeah, and sustainable black societies. For the sad truth is that five countries of Holocaust have made our 
society brittle and unviable. And as the great Marcus Garvey warned over 50 years ago, if we continue as we are, we are heading for, ex for our extinction. More important than any monies to be received, more fundamental than any lands to be recovered, is the opportunity the reparations campaign offers us for the rehabilitation of black people. By black people, for black people. Opportunities of the rehabilitation of our minds, our material condition, our collective re reputation, our cultures, our memories, our self-respect, our religious, our political traditions, and our family institutions. But first and foremost, for the rehabilitation of our minds. Let me repeat that the most important aspect of reparation is not the money the campaign may or may not bring. The most important part of reparation is our self-repair, the change it will bring about in our understanding of our history, of ourselves, and of our destiny, the chance it will bring about in our place in the world. Thank Brother um, JJ for his kind assistance. The only little argument anyone could bring is when you say that reparation is not even 1%. Because the money that is owed is in the trillion. We can't count it. Because if we start to say you owe for this, you owe for that, you owe for that, we say, we're going to say, but what about that? Let me give you an example. Let us look at the monuments, the treasures that has been taken out of Africa and in this museum, and how much money they make by people coming to look at it. So it's not just the return of them, but it's how much money they've made, and from when they've been making all this money, and all the interest that we charge on it. So to be quite honest, I wouldn't even want to be involved in that argument because I would know where to start. Because if they hand over everything they've got, they will still lose. That's how I see it. But money is not the important thing here. What is important is our state of mind. Because today, we Africans are still debating who's an African. We haven't arrive at that. So what does that say about our state of mind? So nobody can argue about the urgency of mind restoration. What we need to be look at is how it can be done. How do we go about it? And I'm saying that we have got to begin to organize in ways we've never organized before. And we've got to listen to each other. We've got to nonsense of egoism that cramp us and mess us up along the way. And respect each other. And be prepared to listen. And be patient with each other. But we must, we must deal with our state of mind. If we have not decide to do that, we have nowhere going. Okay. Now let me just try it. Sister Afian, can you hear now? Hello? Greetings, Sister Afian. No, still no joy. Yes, okay, I can Brother hear Cecil. you. Yeah, I can you just hear had, you. Um... Oh, oh that's brilliant. I can hear you too. <laughs> Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear now. That's great. So we have just started a meeting. So if you could just quickly introduce yourself, just say a little bit about yourself, and then just give us a small um, synopsis of what you what your approach to reparation is. Um, well, I'm not sure what you want me to say about myself. My name is Af Young. And um, what? I'm, I'm, um, I'm an activist. I'm, um, 
I have a background in law and in political science, and um, I'm a revolutionary um, Pan Africanist. Um, what else? I guess that's it for now. Um, in terms of reparations, um, in terms of reparations, I think the, the the question is what the essence of it is. I think that um, in terms of uh, the mass awareness of what it's about, when we talk about reparations, people checks and finance. And um, that's just like Brother Pepekai said, I'm Chin Wezu, that that's probably the least of what it is. It's mainly about repair. But, it, uh, but you know, there are two sides to reparations. There's internal and external. So the internal bit is about repairing ourselves because we're still not prepared, you know. Um, but in terms of the external side, it's only from a position of victim that we can gain reparations from these um, historical criminals. And the position of victory comes from a position of organization, of, of self-organization, of organizing ourselves. And uh, I think um, Elder Pepe can touch on that just now, you know, as to what that will actually mean, you know, in some concrete analysis. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's a question of power. Do we have the power to demand reparations? Do we have the power to compel reparations? And then what does that power mean? It means different things. You know, it means beginning to fend for self in terms of institutions, organizations. And I guess say we're very far away from that. You know, yes. even those of us that speak about it, we're very far. And in terms of political power, you know, it would mean, you know, question around states, although they're new colonial states, you know, but how do we organize ourselves to get power? Well, I guess the question is what, you know, what are the different components of power? And um, it seems that most of us are, you know, asking these criminals, you know, for checks or for some form of repair from them. Even if they did, it would be poisonous, you know, if they gave or did anything. So, um, you know, that's what I would say for now. And, you know, just to say that, you know, um, as a member of Moyo Watai for the Pan African Women's Solidarity Network, you know, I'm glad to um, be in this discussion and you know, to put forward, you know, our own perspectives, our organizational perspectives. Okay. So, um, Brother Cecil, what's your quick response on the a small extract from Chin Wei's paper. Is this something that you go along with? Um, as, as may be known to those who've heard me on reparations, um, I think that self-repair is emphatically our issue. And I, I don't believe that we gain anything by um, dividing reparations in, in, in the way that, that has happened. Um, and focusing on, on self-repair. I don't believe, for example, that any oppressed people ever prepares themselves simply by psychological engagement or even just pure organizational engagement. The best and indeed the only um, terrain for genuine self-repair is the terrain of self-liberation and the terrain of self-unification. And unless you're actually engaged in that, you're not really repairing yourself. And, and, and I certainly think that Chin Wei was wrong to, to, to say that the money is um, less, the, the, the money owed and the money facet is less than 1%. That, that is simply an error. And I think um, Brother Pepperdine has already acknowledged that that, that, that that is an error. So for us to, um, deal with what is um, owed and what is still mounting that we are entitled to from the enemy. We have to liberate and unify ourselves and that is a pathway to our um, <clears throat> reparations as well. Okay. Um, brother uh, Tahaka. Sorry, Brother Tahaka. Yeah. Okay, if yes. I could come in. Um, Yes, my understanding of Chinwezu's position, and I may be wrong, but that's my understanding of it over the years. He's saying that the question of, you know, uh, the financial aspect is, in his opinion, not 1% of what the issue, what the essence of reparations is about. You see, 
if we're in control of ourselves and our continent and our land and our people, then we are able to ask for whatever it is, you know, and compel that. And that's the point I'm making. Because as you know, the popular understanding, it's, it's ironical, even before I got you know, the uh, information for the invite, you know, for today's meeting, I think sometime last week, we were having a meeting amongst comrades here. And, um, you know, one of the comrades, you know, who's, who's Marxist, you know, completely dismissed the reparations movement because some young people were planning to have a reparation. He completely dismissed it. And, you know, when we chatted, he said, why did that? He said, oh, you know, just going around, you know, begging the white man for this, it's not going to get us anywhere. The point, the reason why I bring this up is that that is the popular understanding of reparations, that it is about asking these people for money. And Chimwezu is saying that that is not even 1% of the essence of reparations. And I think I agree with that. Reparations is about liberation, repair, us, ourselves, unification, you know, and that those are the issues. And once you get that, or once we get that, we're able to do that, even just even initiating the processes towards that. Then the question of, you know, the financial aspect becomes automatic. But he's saying that for now, that this concentration, because right now, general understanding of reparations is 90 percent about money when my check i want my check you know like they say they want to check in the uh, post box so how do they put it this is how our people oh. Oh, sister afians has dropped out for minutes all right while she finish, gets back I in okay I can still hear you. I, I just stopped speaking, you know, because I, I just wanted to say something, you know. Okay, okay. I thought you had um, dropped out. I, no, I was no, fine. No. So, um, no. I know there's a, a lot of listeners, and as we say, the reparations, the concentration has always been about um, uh, monetary compensation. So while Chin, while agree with Chin Wesley, while Chin Wesley is saying, let's get ourselves sorted out, let's get our minds sorted out. If it was a case that we just abandon asking for monetary compensation and a hundred years passes and our minds is still not uh, sorted out, don't you think then that would pose a problem in that basically the Europeans will be saying, well, you you haven't asked for the last hundred years. You have completely forgot about it. But Pedataka. Uh huh. The, the example you gave is not a good one. All right. That's we're, not gonna, <laughs> we're not going to sit here and say in the next five years or ten years we'll accomplish mm -hmm. what we set out to do in mind restoration. But. Mm -hmm. I'm glad um, of the contribution of my good sister Afian because on the question of money, as she said, you go anywhere on the street and talk to people, and the first thing they come up with is money. And when you look at money, money is not what we're short of because we have all the resources. If we had the right man, control it for the benefit of ourselves. We have all the money we want. I'm not saying that we shouldn't claim what is owed to us. We should. And I believe also what Chinese was trying to get us focused on is what we need to do for ourselves. The mind appear and not focus on the money. Because let us take what's happening with the Caribbean government. They're asking for reparation. And the question is why? They're bankrupt. The money that they, they have, they have to be paying it to the World Bank and whoever, and they're bankrupt. And they feel that, oh, we can get the money. And they will even enter into deals whereby there's a right half of this. Europe and America will say to them, okay, you owe so much, so we'll 
to a debt cancellation. And then we give a little bit on top to build a few hospitals, a few schools. And they probably will walk away with something like that. Because not too long ago, and with a sense this Zafian can um, put me on track, I think it was Cambridge University who came up and said, yes, reparations are just demand. They raise a, a, a large amount of money and they are forced to think about 10% out of it. And out of that 10%, they will determine how we spent that same colonial mentality. And only because of the condition we find ourselves. Because I tell you what, if I was American Europe, I would hurry up and start to dish out reparation to the government. And therefore I said, this is the end of it, no more. But the question that we must look at is who is driving this? Exactly. Exactly. Who is driving it? Mm -hmm. And we're not the drivers. Because our so called governments, they're all colonial stooges mm -hmm. and beggars. And they will sell us out for nothing. <laughs> when a certain thing they will tell you that um, the man who's now the president of South Africa was sitting on the board of these same criminals who rape our resources. And he was there to turn the guns on our people because they have a better working condition and some a little bit more pay. Why? Because he was part of it and he's now the president. What chance do we have with those bastards? <laughs> One um, okay at this point, no, at this point, Dr. Uh, Cecil, this is a good point to bring in the situation with um Lee Day. You know, it's a good point to bring it in because we just touched on the government and especially the Caribbean governments when they approached, or I don't know who approached who, but it came about that this law firm said they were confident that they could. Um, represent us in the case of reparations. Could you just give us some background as to that? Okay. Lee Day entered the field on the back of an alleged success on behalf of, the, of um, Kenyan, uh, um, Kenyan victims of British um, colonialism in the 50s when they hunted down, um, uh, put into concentration camps, uh, a one million at least Kenyans and killed tens if not hundreds of thousands of, of Kenyans. A few of those victims ended up, who survived, ended up bringing the UK government to court and they won a case which was led by Lee Day. Um, on the back of that, some Caribbean governments, CARICOM if you will, uh, decided that Lee Day were exactly the the firm to employ to pursue a reparations case against Britain. It matters that Lee Day, right at the start of their very first uh, legal opinion, say unmistakably that no, there is no prospect of success in any court for a reparations claim by Africans in relation to slavery and enslavement and even perhaps colonialism. That's the first thing that the Lee Day opinion says. And so the Caribbean government should have jettisoned them at, right at the moment that they read that first opinion. They didn't. CARICOM has been in the field of reparations, seeking reparations for exactly the reason that Brother Pepper I gave since about 2012 or 2013, and absolutely no progress has been made because they are dealing with um, white Western terrorist state entities who, as I said in my remarks, are committed to a stance of refusal of reparation. 
which takes me to the fact that the West has is divided, divided and dividable into hard power institutions, and they are in a mode of refusal of reparations. And then there are some, some soft power Western institutions which are beginning to try to um, deceive Africans into acceptance of much less than is owed and calling that much less than is owed and significantly less than is owed uh, reparations. Uh, Cambridge University is right now carrying out a study and the study will probably follow another one, the first of them, that was carried out by Glasgow University. They said to themselves and to the world, we benefited from enslavement. We are going to look back at our records. We're going to do it ourselves and find out how much we got. They carried out that study and they concluded publicly that they had benefited by 200 million. They then said, and Pepper Guy is right about the figures, they then said, we will set up a reparations fund, not of 200 million, the amount that by which they say they benefited, but of 20 million. And even that they didn't follow through on because in fact, the 20 million sum that is not them saying we're going to offer 20 million, they're offering a much smaller sum than that. And then they're setting up a trust and are hoping that their contribution, not to 20 million, will lead eventually to a 20 million sum that will go to the Caribbean people through the University of the West Indies. It's really very difficult to understand why intelligent Caribbean people are prepared to compromise and collude with that kind of wickedness and foolishness. But we do have some Caribbean people who've gone down or are prepared to go down that road. Cambridge University is making those same kinds of sounds. There is nothing in it for us. And any way that either Caribbean civil society leaders like the, those in the University of the West Indies where I used to teach, or the governments of the West Indies, any way they go down that road, it will be a systemic betrayal of our people. Okay. Uh, Sister Afian. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you know anything about that um, lead dating as well? Would you like to make a comment? Because I mean, being I... Uh, in the law, law profession, you might have Sorry. an angle on it as well. You mean about the position of the lawyers in the Caribbean? Yeah, the whole scenario. What did they think of it? Well, I mean, apart from the specifics of that, you know, just speaking from uh, a legal or a legalistic position, you know, it's, it's, it's about the protection of the powerful, okay? So there is no way we are going to go into justice systems and go and secure a victory against them. It's not happening. And these so-called international courts are really, you know, today, even for example, was on the continent, we probably, well, this criminal, you know, uh, Western European still today. And, you know, we still wear wigs and gowns till today. You know, so in terms of the law itself, it's just a game. It's a, you know, if we, if, if they see that, oh, these people are getting power, then they begin to make small pretenses and give small compromises like say, oh, yes, you know, we'll give an apology and yes, we'll pay so and so, which will be nothing compared to what we need. Just like we see policemen kneeling in, in the U.S. on the protest, you know, they are kneeling with the protesters. That's a actually buy into this kind of, you know, super, you know, the concrete work of really conscientizing them about what reparations is about. But getting back to the, um, you know, legal issue, it's just a waste of time, really, you know, in terms of on this level, it's a power game. Do we at this moment have the power to compel reparations? The, quite, the answer is no. Now, let me give a concrete example. I think, um, I've forgotten which year it was. It probably was the year when they had the uh, International Conference Against Racism, you know, the UN conference in um, Azania. 2001. 
2001. Remember that uh, President Obasanjo, the Nigerian president, before that he had been saying it, but conference, global conference against racism, and said, look, white people don't owe us money. Okay, so when you have a, a class of, you know, the whole ruling class, complete sellouts, neo-colonial leaders, all of them, even if we're even attaining some type of victory, they will be the first to stand in and say, these people don't owe us money. When I was in Ghana, you know, and I think this debate, you know, was going on at one time, they were um, involved in it. The Ghanaian president came out to say, white people don't owe us money. They've been helping us so much. You know, you people want to upset them, leave them alone. They don't owe us money. They've been helping us. In fact, all the aid that they've given us is much more than any of this reparation. You know, I'm saying this is the mentality of the ruling class. Then there's the mentality of our masses. Then there's the mentality of some of us who, you know, are, are, are you know, organizers. So we're going to have to define and determine what we understand by reparations and begin to put that out. And for me, it's not a question of one or the other, or oh, internal repair or external repair. Because, for example, you know, like I said to the, uh, I told you there was a discussion here. We're having a discussion last week here. I said, look, raising, the, just the very raising of the question of reparations, just raising the flag of reparations is a mass conscientization process for our people. And we must use it as a mass mobilization process. So then this comrade said to me, and, and he's Marxist, you know, leftist. He said, oh no, what we need to do is, you know, um, encourage our people to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. We said, yes, but they need to understand how come they're even at the bottom in the first place, you know, to understand how they are, they are the, you know, under the, by the bootstraps. So we've got to, you know, begin to, you know, weaponize reparations, if you like, you know, as a mobilization tool, as a conscientization tool, but ultimately as a tool of organization. And then there's another uh, problem that comes up with this question of reparations. The way that continental Africans view reparations is very different from how diasporan Africans view reparations. And it's very clear, it's, you know, purely because of historical issues and what side of the Atlantic, you know, that they're on. For those, you know, of us who've been privileged to be on both sides of the Atlantic at different times in our lives, we're able to have, you know, a fuller, you know, and a more comprehensive um, understanding of reparations. Now, it's in the same way that Africans in the diaspora, because, you know, they have had that firsthand experience of the uh, uh, Holocaust, of enslavement, you know, they're able to articulate reparations in that way. On the contrary, Africans on the continent have not had, you know, those of us in this generation have obviously not had that, you know, experience. And the history is, you know, in our schools now, they don't teach history at all. Not even that they don't teach African history, they don't teach anything called history. That's number one. Now, for us uh, Africans on the um, continent, the question of the debt crisis is such a fundamental issue. It's a bit similar to the reparations question. But if you ask the diasporan African about the debt crisis, they would dismiss it. It means nothing to them. So therefore, the role of all you know, revolutionaries or pan-Africanists is to be able to merge these you know, issues, these questions, and be able to articulate them in such a way that regardless of which part side of the Atlantic and all over we find ourselves, every African is able to relate to this question. Because on the continent, you know, people think, you know, that slavery was something that happened to other people. Dealing with our reality now, you know, which is, we don't even frame it as neocolonialism, we frame it as corruption, bad people, you know, they're not God-fearing and all this nonsense. So these are all the challenges, you know, that we face. And we're going to have to come, the reparations movement, you know, and, you know, it's been, there have been lots of uh, African black liberals in the, re, leading the reparations movement because they really were thinking that checks were going to come through. We're going to have to reframe the reparations Know, and you know, reframe the positions of what does century. And I think you know that okay, really it's a question of power. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a pity because you're dropping coming in and out, but we know your uh, challenges. 
Um, so, Elder Pepperkai, just before I bring up some of the points the viewers are raising, um, what's your take then on the whole um, lead day uh, approach or the whole Caribbean? Because from my understanding, they approach the Caribbean government's CARICOM. Do you think CARICOM have any business or any right to be negotiating or trying to negotiate any kind of reparation on behalf of the masses? Hold on, you you, you got to unmute your mic, Pepper Kai. Yes, I've done that. Okay, all right. As I said earlier, the desperate for money, and that is the approach looking for money. Because if you look what's going on in the Caribbean, the government, so-called government, we have down there. They don't have a clue about reparation. They're not interested in what reparation is. Mm -hmm. They see it as a way, as a vehicle to get some money. And they're quite foolish because they would see that Lee Day didn't do a good job in Kenya because what little money they did get, <laughs> it was to pay their fees. They get an iron share of it. And the people of Kenya, who did get something, get very little. So, as Brother Cecil and Sister Afian have said before, it's a desperate position that they're pursuing and will not benefit us at all. And what we have to understand, those of us who are campaigning for reparation, that the government of Europe and America, they wouldn't be dealing with us as individuals. They'd be dealing with governments. So let us say that we've advanced and make demands and those demands were met in some way. They'd be dealing with the governments. And the money that would be promised before it even reached there, <laughs> it will be fitted away. So, like the other two brothers and sisters on the panel, um, it would not in any way benefit us at all. And as Sister Fian said, and that is where I start, we have to define what it is and we have to be prepared to organize to achieve it. Okay. Well, I'm just going to bring in a few other. We get a lot of benefit. Yeah. We wouldn't. We don't realize what we could gain until we start the process. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm just going to bring in a few of the um, questions or comments that's been coming in. There's one here. Um, can everybody see that? It might be best if you read it out. From um, Sharon, and she said, with respects, surely we can look at the labor and money. Well, she said, surely we can look at money and um, labor at the same time, money and wealth creation, as well as state of mind. So I think what she's saying, while we are going through, like what we said before, this uh, repairing our minds, there should be a two-pronged approach. We should be pursuing the money while we are also um, trying to repair our minds. That's that um, point there. Could I make a point on, on, on the money business? Because it does seem to me to be massively important. Brother Pepperkai correctly okay. says Brother Pepperkai correctly says that if in effect we own the resources of the world. And then when you look at the, the actual uh, position, all of Africa's wealth is owned here or in China, but particularly in places like London and Bonn and New York. And it means that we're not in any control of our resources and mm -hmm. bringing about a new state of affairs where we're able 
by a process of revolution to unite and to liberate ourselves, in, only in those circumstances will we gain control of our wealth. Leave aside, and, and that's the wealth that's currently being taken. Leave aside what is owed from the period of colonialism. Leave aside what is owed from the period of enslavement. And connected to that is a proposition I put forward earlier, which is that as oppressed and exploited people, the path to self-healing is precisely to be successfully involved in the process of liberating and unifying ourselves. That's how the Haitians became what they, what they were. That is how the Cubans became what they are. That is how the Chinese became what they are. You cannot self-heal whilst you are oppressed unless you are using means of revolution as the tools of self-elevation. Um, yeah, you yeah, are coming. Okay, um, just two things to attempt to address the sister's question. Um, what she's saying is that, you know, I, I, and, and this is the thing that um, some people may be misunderstanding when we're saying, oh, you know, it's not just about money. We're not dismissing the monetary aspect. You know, it's there, it's concrete. It has been uh, the question of our label has been, you know, there's been some, there was some uh, um, figure some time ago, you know, some estimated value, it must be over 15, 20, or 777 trillion. This is something that came out of a conference in Accra. I'm just, you, you know, putting this out, you know, just to let the sister know that the question of the, you know, uh, um, you know, value of labor lost has been addressed. And of course, will need to be addressed because that's what it was. It was working without pay you know, for all those years, even apart from the trauma and the attacks and everything, the question of labor. So we're not dismissing that and saying, oh, you know, that doesn't matter. That's concrete. That's outstanding. That's permanent. That will always be on the table. The question we are dealing with is how do you get that? How do we come about a process of reparations? It is the how. What is the journey? You know, what is the methodology? What is the way? And if we're not organizing for a liberation, you know, like we've been saying, you know, on, on the panel today, then we're not on that road. Now, you find if you look at a lot of, you know, um, people involved in reparations movement, people are just involved just in that on that single issue of reparations. You know, people are not necessarily organizing you know, uh, for power or organizing in, on a wider level, as it were, and thinking that our oral demand for reparations is going to do it. It's not. And this is the question, you know, it's about reparations, victory. How do we get there? We can't get there from a position of weakness, which then makes us come back to the, you know, issues that um, Elder Pepe Kai has been raising that, you know, look at the uh, positions of our uh, leaders, our so-called, you know, the rulers, rather, of our individual countries. So then the question comes back to us. How do revolutionaries, you know, Pan-Africanists get in control of our countries in the Caribbean? How do revolutionaries, Pan-Africanists get in control of our countries on the continent? This is what, you know, where it boils down to. Because let's say, you know, the West, you know, have a, a nightmare and say, oh, guess what? We do owe you reparations. We will pay you X, whatever X is. They're going to be paying it to this, um, you know, uh, uh, ruling class, you know, that we have both on the continent and in the Caribbean, which begs the whole question. If our neocolonial systems are not changed and removed, the question of reparations becomes a dummy question, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, 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 a void issue that, you know, is of no consequence, really. So we're, we constantly are coming back to square one. The, 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 the argument is not about what is owed and who owes us. No, it is how are we going to get it? So to answer the sister's question, the question of labor is fundamental and it's already been monetized. But of course, it will need to be updated you know, at whatever rates you know, we find ourselves in time. So that's not the issue. And, it, you know, the, the issue of enslavement was a question of unpaid labor. 
you know so that's an economic issue there's a psychological issue there's a social issue you know that there's different you know uh, uh, you know aspects to that but i'm saying i'm just saying that to answer you know that specific question that that has already been addressed what the current crisis is now not the crisis what the outstanding question is how we achieve reparations yes brother Tarkin. yeah there's another point here i'd like to bring up another question um, from Again, can you see Kofi Campbell? The West is broke. The welfare, the warfare, the welfare and warfare state has been destroyed. The case of capital accumulation. There is no reparation. There's basically said there's no money left anyway. Even if they wanted to pay reparation, they couldn't. They couldn't afford it. They're broke. Okay, any comments on that? Brother Darker, mm -hmm. the young brother beside me want to answer the question, so I'm going to give way to Okay, the... no, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Uncle Pete. Okay. Yeah. Well, just uh, just introduce really yourself a little bit. Just let people know who you are. This is Brother JJ. Yeah, I'm Brother JJ. Yeah, Brother JJ, affectionately known as JJ the Jigno. Um, I'm I'm generally active in the community. I support Uncle P and what he does, and a few other people that I'm, I'm connected to. Um, in response to the comment, the West is broke. The welfare warfare state has this has destroyed decades of capital accumulation. No repara reparations money can be distributed. Uh, I don't agree with that one. I don't agree with that personally. And I will say that it's not just always about the money. It's really about repairing the relationship. That re reparations, the main part of that word is to repair. And the relationship that, that we as Africans at home and abroad have with the West is a terrible relationship from then until now. So how can they really repair that relationship that they have with us and that's what we're really trying to do here and some some believe this is an exercise of begging white people for money begging white people to give us what they owe us but i i personally see it as putting ourselves in a position to do better business and that's what um reparations is for us i'm happy to be corrected by anybody if i'm getting this gently wrong but um i mean for instance like i'm i was heavily inspired by nipsey hustle um, a, a rapper that died last year and one of the things he spoke about was to have real reparations, to have uh, representation in some of the biggest industries that are going on at the moment um, that to me sounds like Pan-Africanism because you can only have representation if you're really representing someone or something um, we'd also talk about the things like taxes how can, you know and so if we think about some of the relationships that, like for me being in Britain right now, if I wanted to trade with my family in Jamaica, I'm having to go through certain hoops in order to help them have a better relationship and do for self, really wanting to do for self, but having to pay crazy taxes just in order to be able to do that. If you're really gen genuine about repairing the bond that you, that uh, repairing the breach that you have, uh, that you've had over us, then you can do things like that, where which means I can help, I can reach out and, you know, and just 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 trade with my cousin in Jamaica, putting him in a better position and, and giving him a better quality life, because of the reparations that they've that that, that they can actually do. So there's, I believe there's many different ways in which the we can uh, encourage the West to support us. So we just have to really put ourselves in a position to do that, and uh, to to put it simpler. If you rob my phone on the way to school yesterday, today you can't shake my hand and say, we're all friends, it's over. We've got to work out a way that, yeah, we can be friends maybe, but the least, the very least I need is my phone back. Otherwise, every little issue, every little bit of friendship you're offering me is ridiculous, especially when I need to call my mom to tell her I'm going to be home late from school. And you say, don't worry, you can borrow my phone, but you need to pull yourself up before your bootstraps. That's a, that's a disrespectful conversation. So that's my response to said and I hope that was clear. Okay. Brother JJ, could you just do me a favor? Yeah. The, 
they you need to adjust the camera because okay, you can so hardly see your face. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Um, That's so a lot I'm, better, yeah. Yeah, hold on. How about if I do this? If I do this now and adjust it so yeah. I don't okay, while, you're, while you're doing that, um I'll put up another point. This is another point by the same sister, Sister Sharon again. And she's saying, let's wait for people to Yeah, and to put up another point that's coming. If money is not important, how can Africa welcome welcomes in the investment from the Chinese? Without a doubt, we need, we need a holistic preparation. But leaving out economic reparation does not make sense to me. So I don't know if you're seeing that. If money is not important, basically, why is, how come China's got the money to invest in Africa? Um, Leave it okay. up for a while so everybody can look. Yeah, Sister Afian? Two things, you know, um, from your brother's answer, um, Brother JJ, we see that um, that's the va a lot of our people still see this current social economic system, this capitalist system, mm -hmm. as um, viable and legitimate, and we think that we're going to be able to do some business within this system, and you know they'll they'll make some space for us and they'll allow us to do this. It's not. It's, it's you know. It shows that it's, we're just not understanding what about with this capitalism system in place. There will be no reparations, as the dominant said. There will be no reparations within this capitalist system. You know. So seeing it like you know, oh, it's for them to maybe they'll shift a bit, give us some space for us to begin to, um, or, you know, to to operate as equals, you know, within their system. I don't see that happening. Now, no. to the question that has just been asked, the second question, I think that we're still not understanding, you know, the discussion. We're speaking about reparations as distinct to what is happening now with, you know, in, in terms of the relationship, you know, of our uh, new um, colony economics with, you know, the dominant imperialist, you know, systems. If money is not important, how come African governments are asking for money? African governments are asking, and by the way, the money they even ask for, they don't even use it for development. They squander it, you know, because they are new colonies. So that's a different and distinct uh, a question, you know, from the issue of reparations, you know, both for colonialism and for slavery. In terms of neocolonialism, which is what affects us now, we're also at the same time going to have to confront, you know, our current leaders. So, you know, raising the issue of oh, if money is not important, that's not, I think we're beginning to mix things up. You know, I don't know if, you know, um, any of the other speakers want to clarify that, but I see that, you know, there's a confusion between the reparations discourse and what is happening now you know, with our neo-colonial states and the relationship they have with, you know, Western, you know, uh, countries. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if Elder Cesar did this get to the last um, question. Yes, I, I got part of it. And, and I think that there is another fundamental misunderstanding there. Um, we've, we've come to believe that there is something benevolent, not just about aid, but also something benevolent about foreign direct capitalist investment, whether it comes from China or from the West. And we haven't bothered to read and listen to Walter Rodney, who has an important analysis that points out that foreign direct capitalist investment is actually the key mechanism of exploitation that is currently being used against us. Um, you have a case of Guyana, where they've discovered holy oil deep down in the sea. To pull it out will involve a whole heap of sludge and dirt, um, garbage uh, effectively, as well as gas that they are going to flare. The money will go back to the people who pretend to have invested. But when you look at the agreement, what you find is that the Guyanese are actually paying for the investment themselves. And that is always the character of foreign 
domestic investment, foreign capitalist investment. And what we need to do, given, for example, the point that Pepekai was making about the, the, the extent of African riches, unless we gain, when we gain control of that, we will be able to organize collectively on a continental scale to invest in African development, any kind of development that we want. While Africa is under the control of neocolonial um, capitalist imperialism, we'll never be able to do that, which is again why the issue of the struggle for, indeed the revolution for African liberation and unification is the crucial question. Mm -hmm. that, that is the route by which we will enable ourselves to force the enemy to, 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 um, to, to compensate. And also, that is the means by which we will stop them ripping off from us now more than they ever have in the past. Okay. Yes, sir, Pepekai? Yeah. In fact, um, the program we had last week looking at the situation in Ethiopia. Yes. Here is a country that decides and a development plan, and in that development plan, they want to build a dam. Not a small dam, but a big one. And the amount of money that was raised did not come from China, did not come from the World Bank, the IMF, and no outside investors. It was put together by the Ethiopians themselves. Also, when I look at the construction site, I didn't see one non-Ethiopian there. What does that say to us? It's about our self-confidence, mm -hmm. belief, mm -hmm. organization. Mm -hmm. And that is what reparation is about. First and foremost, to understand that we are our own liberators. Nobody going to come from outside to save us. Whatever we want, we have to do it ourselves. And we have to look at ways we've never organized before. What well, Brother Cecil said, there's no way we can achieve what we want without revolution. I agree with him. But revolution doesn't mean it's always at the point of a gun. Because if we said it's only at the point of a gun, Muslim going to shoot Christian, Christian going to shoot Muslim. We are so divided because our minds are so confused. And even within Christianity, Church of God going to fight Seventh-day Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists going to fight Anglican, and we could go on and on and on. So, we must begin to look to see well. Where do we start? At the moment, in Britain, we're doing um, homeschooling. In the Caribbean, in Africa, we call ourselves civil societies if we have our heads together. The first thing we have to look at, what is the curriculum we send our children to in these schools. After the history, history of the world, African place in it, and African ancient history. Must be. There's no way we can say it's a school system that doesn't have history. Then we have to design ourselves, our curriculum. In fact, we made a big blunder. Those of us who are Jamaicans, when the Jamaican government said, can I teach Marcus Garvey in school? We said, yes, we come and help you. And we'll help them design a curriculum. We didn't. We said, the colonial government, and we didn't deal with them. And the thing remains the same. So as Sister Afian said, and I'm fully agreement with her, is outlining Chenwezu that we have to organize. And in our organization, we we'll have to look at the weakness in our institution, the weakness in our organization, and now we begin to put it right. 
it may seem impossible because how do we defend ourselves when we're going down the road? Yeah. I mean, take someone like Walter Rodney, a brilliant scholar, and he was stuffed out in no time because the colonial regime and international gangsters wipe him out in no time. So, it's no easy task we face, and it almost looks impossible. But I'm saying we have the mind, and once we have the will, there's a way. And we just have to put aside our egos, our individuality. We have to accept that we cannot achieve anything without respecting each other, be patient to work into each other, understanding with each other, and begin to put one brick on top of another brick. The greatest threat is how we defend our gains as we go along. Because the Sophia point out that our so-called leaders in our different countries, they're the first one to lock us up and to murder us. So it's no easy task. It looks almost impossible. But it has to be done. It has to be done by us. And I'm saying that this year is the seventh year that you have the reparation march here in this country. And I'll do everything I can, and all of us should do everything you all can to ensure that this seventh year becomes a milestone that we see that we must work together. We have no other choice. We may not like each other, we may not love each other, but we have all that we've got, and we better understand that. Brother Sahaka. Yeah. Come, come I in there. Yes, I wanted to quickly uh, come in on something of the said when he said, oh, you know, it, it's mm -hmm. revolution, you know, we don't do it at the barrel of a gun. You see, this is the thing. Um, where we need, not we, yes, yes, we need, and that's a pretty word, we need a cultural revolution before we have a political revolution, political quote and unquote. Because with revolution, it, it is about transformation. And if there are forces to be confronted, they will need to be confronted both internal and external. Now, the reality of the matter, as we speak today, we don't even have the capacity to even do you know, uh, 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 you know, certain type of confrontation first. But the worst point, you know, which is the point uh, of the kind, which is that the mind has still not been liberated. So the question of cultural, having a cultural revolution is the premise, will be the basis for having a political revolution. Because, you know, now, even if we say, oh yeah, let's have the same if we say, you know, let the white people pay or let the Arabs pay, those of us who are Muslims and those of us who are Christians will, you know, be on the side of their masters abroad. So it comes back, you know, to us, you know, a shift in the mind. Now, that question, the question of a cultural revolution, sorry, I don't know if there's disturbance from here. The question of a cultural revolution is work that we all need to be done, uh, that, sorry, that we all need to do. Because, you know, where our people are at, now, the masses of our people, it is unbelievable. Our people are still far away in terms of their minds. And so it means that, you know, those of us who think we know and who have, you know, spent so much of our life doing this kind of work still have so much work to do. So I just want to say to Elder Pepe Kai that cultural revolution is the first step. But we must never, you know, say, oh, no, you know, revolution is impossible. It's not. You know, when Cuba did her revolution, you know? It was a handful of people saying, you know, that nothing is impossible. That's the point, you know, I'm making. And the question of uh, armed confrontation is also not something that we need to run away from. Uh, when Nkrumah was in power, you know, he was under the illusion, you know, that you could discuss, negotiate, you know, and go back and forth, you know, with the imperialists. When we got rid of him, he realized that the question of African unity, because first of all, it's a question that needs to be resolved amongst Africans before we're able to face these people, that even maybe that question of African unity, that internal question, quote unquote, will need to be 
you know, break down as in terms of, you know, which side are you on? Do you see? So I'm saying, you know, we need to get a bit more radical about these issues. There needs to be more of a sense of urgency about it, you know. And, you, and, and the question of revolution, you know, you do what you need to do. If Cuba said they were waiting, you know, for all every Cuban, you know, to first gain consciousness before they launch their revolution, they would still be waiting now because all the Cubans would still be praying, you know, doing their Hail Marys, you know, uh, uh, 10 times a day. Yeah? So I'm saying there must be no apologizing about the question of revolution. We must explain it. We mustn't be able to confront it. And of course, we must also explain to our people that revolution is not just a question of armed conflict. The word revolution actually means a transformation. So then how are we going to get a transformation? Because there may well be other ways we can get a transformation, but you know, to make it a popular, legitimate word and not to make it you know, a word that when we say, oh, guns and blood, you know, then we're all running away because we're dying anyway. We're dying anyway. I'll leave it for here, Brother Tahaka. Mm. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Just to bring things back down to earth, Pepper Kai, just before you come in, I'd just like to raise a couple of points that we can talk around as well. Um, the question of reparation, when the British government is asked, I think it was under Tony Blair, as we know, he refused to apologize. He gave what he called a statement of regret. That's as far as they would go. When Cameron visited Jamaica in 2015 and Portia Simpson brought up the question of reparation, I think Cameron's reply was, that was a long time ago, let's move on, just move on. But I can't help, I can't offer you 25 million to help you build prisons. That's the money he was willing to offer, right? And at the same time, there was a politician called Michael Portillo formerly of the Conservative Party. And on a, on a certain program, same question of reparation came up. And he just bluntly says, no, we can't afford it. That's something we just, we just, just uh, should forget about. Now, Brother Pepekai, I know you know of somebody in America that actually brought the case to the United States Congress. I think his Brother Nohusi. And can you just explain what happened when he stood before Congress and there was put in the argument of reparation? Who was it that came up to block the whole thing? Yes, before I answer that, I want to go back to the point Sister Ophian raised about cultural mm -hmm. revolution. I hope um, that misunderstood. I'm not saying that the point will not come when it has to be an armed struggle for revolution. But I'm glad the system make the point that revolution is not just only taking up the gun because the greatest point of revolution is a cultural revolution. And I want to go back to the Chinese who Bela Cecil talks about earlier. And when they went through the armed struggle, they also went through the cultural revolution. And the Chinese, in my opinion, didn't want much of a cut. I will, a cultural revolution because they always know the Chinese. They were not dispersed and messed up as we were, but yet they see the importance of that alignment. So I'm glad your sister came and brings it out much clearly than I did because that is a fundamental way of moving. Because let us say that we begin to engage with our artists or radio station and say, listen, we need to push the culture because right now, conscious music is in decline and slackness is taking over the, the, um, the front page. So the cultural revolution is not something vague that we can do and we need to move on. Now, let's come to the point to ask whether um, but, um, I talk about. Mm -hmm. It was um, Nehusi Coates, that's the son of... Um, yeah, just before you carry on, Pepper Kai, there's some, lot of music in the background. I don't know which... Who's the neighbors, what, what do I can do with the neighbors? Oh, okay, okay. All right, All right carry on. Yes. And he's um, made a very um, good presentation at Congress about reparation 
And um, in fact, it's a pity by the talker. We didn't come more to play because I think it's about nine or so minutes. We could have played it. It would be so informative. But the long and short of it is that they brought another brother from the um, Republican Party. He was um, maybe a congressman or whatever he was. Young man. And he said that um, it would be about division. Asking for reparation, what bit about division? <laughs> division in who? We may ask. And it's also be an insult to ancestors. We are asking for money. Holy but nonsense. But we understood very clearly that this nonsensical argument will always be raised, like Cameron, like Portello, as to why reparation should not be met. Okay. Hold on. The, the, you might have to talk to your neighbors and all the music is allowed. Um, but the right. when, when I say uh, neighbors, you know, they're not like next door. They're way over the other side. They're on the other uh, street. <laughs> That's what I've got to right. All right. So I'll bring up another point here. Um, Sister Borto. Oh, the brother Kofi Campbell as well. The problem is FDI, but government ripping off taxpayers. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. Um, no, again, I, again, I know, I know the brother, and if, if, if I may address that, um, okay. Of course, governments, neo-colonial governments, even um, uh, capitalist governments, democratic ones in in the West, rip off taxpayers. That that that's a truth. The point I'm making about foreign direct investment is that that has to be understood for what it is. It is not benevolent. It is it is the key way in which um, in which foreign capitalists, Western capitalist imperialism, rips off third world African Caribbean places, um, and and it is very important that that is understood by us and how they do it. And I recommend um, that people read Walter Rodney on this. He it, it's in a a speech that he made um, in the United States, um, obviously b before they killed him. Um, before the end of the program, I'll refer people to the journal um, where the, the the article was was um, was was where the speech was reproduced as an article. Very important that we understand it. Um, the, hey, Jamaica. Um, it looks as if you know some American. Canadian companies invested in bauxite. The bauxite is all gone. Jamaica is still poverty stricken. There was a moment in the 70s when Manley tried to get an extra half a percentage on, on the, the bauxite levy. And that was the primary reason why America brought him down. Right now, the Guyanese have negotiated around oil and the deal is fundamentally awful. They are paying for the destruction of their environment. And they're paying for the investment that these oil companies are supposed to be making. The deal is there to be analyzed. Okay, I'll just bring up another point by the same brother here, Brother Kofi. And he's referring to um, Garvey would have supported FDI, no, Garvey's dead. not. No, I'm afraid Brother Kofi's wrong about that as well. Brother um, Marcus Garvey is not an example of foreign direct capitalist investment. That is about Africans in the West organizing a project to develop Liberia against Firestone and against the African American, um, the Americo Liberians. And that is why that combination of, fi of Firestone. And the Americo Liberians um, um, destroyed Garvey. 
It was a, not an example of foreign direct capitalist investment. It was an example of of the the self mobil the cooperative self mobilization of African resources for African development. That's what the Liberia project was. Oh. Okay, Brother Fepitai or Sister Afian, you want to comment on the last point? Um, I don't think Gavi believed in... Sorry. Um, Gavi didn't believe in foreign investment, especially, you know, from the imperialists. He, he had a can-do, you know, attitude, you know, uh, to, to, to us. And that, that was the very essence of Gavi, autonomy. You know, autonomy. Now, having said that, if he had actually, um, you know, come to the continent and maybe, you know, been in control of a country to the, you know, but that's, you know, we could only have known that if you know, that process had happened. But my understanding of Gavi is that he was all about, you know, African autonomy. Yeah. Important. The diaspora has been foreign. Important, my sister, a great deal is known about the Liberia project. We know how much money Garvey, um, Garvey had. We know how much in, was invested. We know that he sent um, ex, an exploratory um, team to go there. We know that he put resources in, and we know what happened to it. We know that Firestone and the French and the British told the American Liberians to sabotage the project. And they proceeded to do so, including stealing the the, the, the capital and other equipment that Garfield had put in there. It's a documented project. I've written about it myself. <laughs> All right. Mm. So that's there's another point here. I don't know what to make of it. Um it said, What is your view on ADOS movement in the USA? Um what are they? Uh, I don't know that much about them. I suppose they have a approach and reparation as well. well. Can I just respond on 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 ADOS? Um, mm -hmm. it, it's African Americans who are saying they are exceptional in the West and maybe exceptional Africans in the world, and they're saying that because they say that when you look at the United States of America, they're the only ones who went through enslavement. That is that is undoubtedly true. But that is not what makes them distinctive. The enslavement that was experienced in, in North America, in what is now the United States of America, was virtually identical to what Africans went through in Brazil or the Caribbean or Haiti or any Suriname. Or the, what makes African Americans unique is what, after the Civil War, white power put them through. They instituted a regime of terror in the aftermath of enslavement, all of the stuff that we hear about um, this and that massacre, um, we, we know the names of some of the cities, all of the stuff that we know about lynching, all of the stuff we know about eye rape and so on, all of the stuff that we know about how terrorized African Americans had been made is, is Stuff that happened after enslavement, not stuff that happened during enslavement. And that is what has to be understood. People have to read, for example, W.E.B. Du du Bois's um, um, Black, Re Black Reconstruction. People have to understand what happened to African Americans after enslavement, not during enslavement. There's next to nothing unique about what happened to them during enslavement. And the ADOS people are simply wrong. Okay. Um, anybody else want to chip in there and aid us and what you think uh, the direction is that they're taking? Sister Afian, are you still there? Yes, I am. I see Brother Pepper Kai wants to speak. Brother Pepper Kai wants to speak. So, yeah, I'll speak no, after I don't that. Know. I'm saying that Princess make the point. All right. <laughs> Yes, well, that's true. Uh, but I think, you no, know, the, the point has been made about maybe an aspect of how they're defining themselves. I haven't um, studied them too deeply. You know, I've just read a bit and stuff. And I must say, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I, I don't want to be rude or disrespectful. But 
I, I think you know they're just going off on a tangent, you mm. know, uh, wanting to effectively they're cutting themselves off, you know, that then. And, and so, it's important that ADOS is just a sadly, small movement. I think this is, no, no, yeah, they don't want to. ADOS is just a American small movement. It doesn't represent the, the majority yeah. of African yeah. America, who I hope have a much better understanding about their situation and the extent to which the terror exactly. came at them. Obviously, yeah. enslavement was terroristic, but the real terror came at them from the white population mm -hmm. who wanted to put them back in their place after they helped to liberate themselves by fighting on the side of the North in the Civil War and then, for a moment, had some local state power. And that's what was reversed by white racism using systemic terror against African Americans. And that's, that's the specific experience that they have. Nothing like that happened in the Caribbean. The closest we got to it was Barbados, where... Um, there's a little bit larger white population, and they organize a system of terror, labor laws, prisons, and so on, after enslavement that bears some relationship to, to, to what happened to African Americans. But even Barbados was not a patch of what happened to African Americans after enslavement. Well, the, um... There's no more points here. So I'd like to raise another point. You've got yeah. a lot of institutions now coming forward, you know, Barclays Bank and Lloyds Bank. All those institutions now coming out and admitted that, yes, they benefited greatly from slavery. And they want to uh, make amends. And the way they want to make amends is like, you know, putting up scholarships or doing some project within the community. Do you think, any, do you think such an approach could ever... Um, kind of negate them from the whole reparation question because I think what they're saying, if we do a little bit on the side, we may be left out of the equation when it comes to the big payout. We absolutely mustn't go down the road of that deception. Remember that in my initial presentation I've, I've said that white power divides between hard power and soft power. The hard power aspect of all of the Western states simply say no reparations. For example, the Tony Blair thing that you were, you were, you were quoting earlier. The, the states say that. And the CARICOM people have already discovered that they're not getting anywhere after seven years of talking to the Western countries about reparation. No progress whatsoever. Now, behind that, we have a series of institutions it starts with universities who say, wow, some terrible things happened during slavery uh, or enslavement, and we benefited. To what extent did we benefit? Glasgow is the first of them, university. Glasgow says we benefited. This repetition. Um, we benefited to the tune of, 100 mil, of 200 million. And then they immediately say, not that we are going to set up a 200 million fund out of our own resources that we stole from you, what they actually say is we're going to set up a 20 million fund. And then the 20 million fund don't come out, even though it's only 10%, it doesn't come out of the 200 million. They, they, I don't know what they've offered, they're considerably less than, than 20 million. And then they say this little, much less than 20 million that we're offering, um, we will help with that to help you raise some money up to the 20 million and we're going to give it to you or one of your major institutions like the University of the West Indies and I'm afraid Professor Hilary Beckles has fallen for that one. It's, it's, it shouldn't be called reparations. It's unconnected to the scale of the extent of their benefit under enslavement to the extent of their benefit under colonialism and it's unconnected to the fact that they're all central to the continuing ripoff of Africans on a monu of Africa and Africans on a mon monumental scale and the, the extent to which they're doing nothing as institutions and they could about what's happening to us around policing, around housing, around this, that, everything. All of the oppression that we face in these metropolitan countries, all of those universities are implicated in, in its continuance. All of them provide intellectual backing and support for the structures of ripoff, including what happens in the city of London, between um, they control our gold, our diamonds, our platinum, everything is controlled here. 
and 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 the, mm. the justification and arguments that come from universities and think tanks that they set up. So those institutions mustn't deceive us. We mustn't let them do it. Okay. Uh, any other points? Any other comments on that before I take another uh, point again from um, Kofi Campbell? And again, he's saying now, um, FDI simply people will people will capital investing in countries that lack capital. Whether it's Garvey, uh, Liberian scheme, or his support of United Fruit Company in Jamaica, I I know brother um, Kofi Campbell. You know, <laughs> I know, I know you're saying no. He's determinedly on but, this um, He's determined on this occasion, failing to understand. I, I I all I can tell you, brother Kofi, is read Walter Rodney on this matter. Um, our countries don't lack capital. Right. What what we in the Caribbean lack is a willingness to exclude capitalism and organize our local resources in our own benefit. Just think, for example, if there was one African state and that state, whether through companies or directly itself, was organizing African development, economic development, it would need no external capital and it wouldn't have to allow foreign companies to pretend to be investing. What Rodney tells us is how they do it, you know. They, they, they do it by taxation agreements and by something called amortization. So a company will pretend to put in 100 million. Within three years, they've written it off by amortization or by, by taxation. That is to say, the local government gives them back the money within two, sometimes three years. In the case of Guyana, um, the, 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 the repayment of the money to the, to the white capitalist company started before the investment was actually finished, right? And then after that, they're the only ones who get anything because they own the whole thing. It's unbelievably oppressive. And our inability and unwillingness to understand that means that we think of ourselves as capital poor and think of ourselves as needing capital and all kinds of oil companies and, and, and um, as, as, as stupid as fish, we allow them to come and take out our resources and pauperize people who've been fishing for thousands of years. Suddenly there's no fish in their fishing grounds and, and some ships come and take it all away. And, and, some boy who's been in, in, uh, educated at, at the Sorbonne says, we got three million, and look what we can do with three million. 50,000 fishermen along the Senegalese coast can't fish anymore. No wonder they're leaving Senegal and walking across the desert, getting killed, in, in dying in the desert, and dying on, 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 the, on the Mediterranean, and now dying in the English Channel. Some of those are Africans. Yeah? So we have to understand that unless we get back control of our resources in Africa and in the Caribbean, um, not to do that has major implications for our fate in the world. Okay. Um, okay. Anybody want to address that point as well, Sister Afian? You see, we keep on coming back, you know, and just as it's been yeah, said, you know, um, mm -hmm. like Cecil said, um, well, oh, is facing but, technical challenges. Yeah, but, yeah. Mm. yeah. Refuse Or, or an unwillingness, you know, uh, to see ourselves in any other way. Yeah, okay, I'm back. Hi. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you keep coming in and out at the moment. You're, you're facing so. some challenges at the, the voice, my sister. It, it, it's, yeah, it just... Yeah. Yeah. It, look look at a country like Nigeria. So much money, so much wealth, 
so much resources. We don't need money from nobody. We could even sponsor the rest of the continent. But, you know, look at the state we're in. So it take, it's, it's the mind, you see, and that brings us back to reparations that we need to take back control of our minds to have a can-do spirit, to even start, you know, little things on our own, to see that we don't need capital from these criminals. We give them the money. The yeah. day we shut the tap, you know, when we switch the tap off, you turn it off, you will see Europe and America collapse. Yes. But, you know, to the extent that we continue this illusion and delusion about, you know, needing foreign capital, it's a lie. We give them, you know, 1,000 pounds. They give us 100 pounds and they say they've given us aid. Mm -hmm. It's a farce, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So we need to come out of it. it brings us back to what Elder Pepper Kai was saying earlier. You know, and you know, it's a question. We need a cultural revolution. If the mind is not fixed, if the African mind is not reclaimed, no African resource will be able to be reclaimed. Because at the end of the day, it, it comes down to the mind. It comes down to the mind. And this is where we're at. And you will even find so-called lawyers, bankers, I'm saying Africans, you know, lawyers, bankers, this and that, telling us all these lies about foreign investment. That's because they have a role, you know, and, and, and an interest, you know, in uh, maintaining the status quo. You know? So we need to be clear. There is nothing really about foreign direct investment. We fund them even yes. till today as I speak. We have the resources, we have the capacity on our land, but what we do not have is the mindset. When we still see white people, all of us, even some of us that are even so-called educated and have some of this wretched, deep at the back of our mind, the white man is still our God. You know, literally, figuratively, economically, politically, socially, but worst of all, mentally, he has lodged himself so deeply in our psyche that, you know, to uproot him, you know, that is the struggle for reparations, to uproot him out of our mind, out of our psyche, out of our spirits. That's the battle we're facing. That's why we keep on continuing having discussions about we need foreign direct investment when we have been investing in them. Not okay, just all right. Just okay. before you come in, Brother Pepper Kai, I want to raise a point. I think there's a few more points to come up. The, um, when Sister um, Afian talk about investing in them, we should not forget in the Francophone part of Africa that about the 500 billion that Africa, those countries are investing in France. Mm -hmm. Every year they have to pay France back. And if they want their money, their money, what is in the French bank, the French only allows them at any one point to access 15% of it. And that's mm. with an interest on top. And the latest I heard now, they have to be now, France is now demanding uh, the going rate for interest. Because I think what's happening with COVID is hitting France hard. So France is now putting a squeeze on those countries for even <laughs> more money. So that makes the point that we are the one investing in them. And um, yes, Brother Ceci, you wanted to come in? Um, okay. Um, the way France organized neocolonialism is dramatically different from the way Britain organized it. And it is something that we don't have a deep enough understanding of. One of the people who'd written about was um, a brother from East Africa called Samir Amin, who uh, wrote about the structure of, 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 of French neocolonialism. And it addresses those issues about how um, at the moment of independence for Francophone Africa, they forced African resources to be held as in um, gold deposits and so on to be held in, in Paris and they're still there with these conditions that would be just being talked about by um by our our brother uh, uh, Tahaka. I just want to make one small but I think actually important point about 
um, cultural revolution, um, it matters that when the, the, the Chinese did the cultural revolution, they had already spent the time between the 1920s and the late 1940s carrying out an actual revolution in which they defeated the, 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 the Japanese and the whole of Western imperialist hold on, on China and threw them out. And when in the 60s and 70s they were talking about a cultural revolution, they were talking about an already liberated and unified China. They, 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 they're so unified that even though their language is several languages, they say to themselves, they on the speak Chinese. They speak a variety of Chinese that, that are actually spoken. There's not one, one, one language at all. But that's what you can do if you have thrown out the enemy and mastered your terrain and are organizing your head and your resources, your intellectual resources and your economic resources. That is why China is that powerful. And the, the arrow in African history in the last 50 years is that our revolution stopped at throwing out colonialism and didn't learn what um, Nkrumah was telling them, which is that the enemy wasn't just colonialism, that the enemy was capitalism, imperialism, and that we had to break with that. And neocolonialism, even when they forced us to fight them militarily, they still ended up in control of all of the places where we fought them militarily in, na in armed national liberation. They still still end up in neocolonies. So the enemy now is neocolonialism represented by people who look like us. And that is the enemy that we have to defeat. Um, hmm. and if we can defeat it culturally, that's all well and good. But I think more than a cultural revolution is required in Africa to liberate and unify that place. And neocolonialism has to be seen at, by, as the enemy, and that story has got to be taken to the masses. Let me just okay. quickly say, sorry, Brother Taka, let me just quickly say something that... No, when I, yeah, revolution, I'm talking about culture in, in, in its whole and, you know, uh, complete... Um, framework, as in the mind, yeah. you see. So I'm, I'm talking about regaining the mind because I think that, you know, without that, so that's what I mean when I talk about culture, you know, about the recapturing of... Those remarks, of those remarks are not directed at you, my sister. The position, you know, that, I know, I, I, the position that I was yeah. arguing is not the one that you... All right, all right. Let's, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. No, I was just saying that also for clarity for people because yeah. even as we speak, we're also learning anyway. You know, and, and I obviously that even needs to be, we need to dig deeper on that, you know, that how do we go forward? Because obviously, as you you all know, you know, that, that's been um, a question we've been discussing about what is the mission of this generation, i.e. what is the thing that confronts us the most now in this 21st century as Africans? And, you know, for us in Moewa Taifa, you know, we think it's, it's a question of neocolonialism, you know, and defeating it. You know, but it's a challenge because the neocolonialists look exactly like us. Mm -hmm. You know, it was very easy to drive out the white man. You know, they kill us enthusiastically. That's right. That's our challenge now. You know, the the identification and the defeat of neocolonialism. But yeah, sorry, brother Tahaka. Mm -hmm. No, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, just before I bring up some more points, Elder Pepper, Kai, you wanted to say something. Yes, I don't know if the noise in the background. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, carry on, carry on. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> no, Sister Rafian um, gave us an example. Throughout Africa and the Caribbean, when you go to a court to address court matters, the lawyers have on wigs. No. If we have to have wigs, can't we make a wig that looks like us? No. And that goes back down to the core of the mind. Because when we talk about defeat and colonialism, it's about putting white people physically out of our space. But it goes deeper than that. It's about the ideas, the way of doing things, 
a way of seeing the world. And that is what we haven't been doing. Is returning to a way, a way of seeing the world, a way of acting in the world. And until we begin to do that, and I'm saying that we don't have to start an armed revolution to begin that process. For example, right here in Britain, an African organization can get together and say, listen, how do we start this process? And we will say, okay, language is a key component, or name is a key component, education is a key component, and we could say, okay, at one time, Kiswahili would suggest us the language that we should be adopting. If that's still true, and if it's so, let's move on it. We started right here. We're in touch with brothers and sisters in other places. We begin that movement. How far we can get with that? We have, if we tried it in earnest, we surprise ourselves how far we can get. Again, come back to a curriculum. We start with our Saturday school here. And we build on that. And as we educate ourselves globally, our people say rubbish. What is going on in so-called school? Is that what we want? This is better. And we take our, um, our artists, I know people with radio station. We start right there. I say, listen, we need to focus on the conscious music. Bring that back in. And I believe if we approach this in earnest with discipline, with will and commitment, we'll surprise ourselves how far we will reach. But we have to make a start. Okay. And we start small and we build up. All right, I'm just going to bring up a few more comments on that's been put in the um, that's been sent by the viewers. Well, again, you have gone back to why don't we take the money from banks to help with community projects? That's one point. There's another point here. I'm in favor Everybody of that. Needs... Our string. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> there's another point here again. Everybody needs to trade within and across borders. That's how um, living standards improve. So that's another point there. Uh, there's another no, point nobody's here. Made them. Nobody's made any point yeah. against trade. Okay. Uh, another one here. Can the panel suggest the best way or the next steps that needs to be taken to move forward? In the direction uh, Brother Cecil suggests. So you suggested a direction, and I think he was talking about um, revolutionary pan Africanism. Yeah. She's asking, what's the best way to do that? Um, start by listening to listening into our discussion next <laughs> next week, when this is exactly the issue that we're going to be this this going to be discussing how the OAU and the AU represent neocolonialism in Africa and, and, and the, the, the conceptions and the steps that we have to take to address that. That's our subject next week. There'll be a panel. Maybe, maybe, um, maybe Sister Afion will join us. If, um, yeah, and this one again is saying, well, as we said, we have the capital already. Why do we need to pursue reparations? No, um, very briefly, reparations is owed, right? Um, there's a, there's, the arguments for, for reparations are set out all over the place, you know, but the best book on it, easily available, is by a white woman called Nora Whitman. Th that book is called Slavery Reparation, The Time Is Now. All of the arguments are there. She only deals with enslavement, but historically, any wrong against any people that involves crimes against humanity 
um, that involve um, that kind of thing gives them an entitlement to reparation. That's a matter of international law. <coughs> yeah. So our entitlement to reparations isn't in dispute. So, and the reason we're not getting it is because of power, because we have organized ourselves into disempowerment and have allowed the enemy to push us further into disempowerment. And the route to reparations, indeed to our salvation, is the, the, the task of finding a way to liberate and unify ourselves. And the quicker we do that, the better, because things are not getting any better. They're getting active, systematically worse as we speak, as we okay. sit here. Yeah, just before we move on, could I just make a point, what you just said? You said reparations is, an, is um, governed by international law, and that's an entitlement. Yes. Yes. Th those countries that are all reparation, have they openly come out and said they actually agree with that point? No, they don't. They, they control international law. And so they have an entire system of subverting this. I have a long paper on these matters that I perfectly pre pre present and will present at, on some future occasion. But so their refusal is not based on mm -hmm. law. Is based on the rejection okay. of their own law. For example, the claim that enslavement was legal at the time is entirely bogus. The, um, the British, when they abolished slavery, you can go and look at the, the, the act to abolish um, slavery and enslavement in the British Empire. You will find that no British law was set aside in 1833 when they abolished enslavement, because there was no law in favor of slavery on the British statute book. None, for centuries. What they did was use um, what they did in the colonies and, and pretend that what was happening in the colonies was, was legal, and then they brought it into British law by the courts and by the Privy Council. Yeah, it's a long story. We can understand these things. We understand some of them. And the arguments that they bring against reparations, they say it was legal. They say it was too long ago. Um, they say it wasn't them. They say that we aren't properly the descendants and that set of things. And it, it's a, a set of anti-legal denials that rest on their power to say no. So they, they are subverting international law in the process of refusing to, to come forward, right? In respect of everybody else in the world, this is a good point in Chin Weizu's famous paper from 93. He says that the 20th century is the century of reparations, and it continued into the 21st century. Um, after, the second, after the First World War, all of the countries that were violated by Germany got reparations from Germany. After the Second World War, the Japanese, who the Americans had illegally um, locked up during the war, were compensated. Some Indian people, all down the Americans, have been compensated, given their land back. Nothing in proportion to what is really owed. Uh, Maoris have been comp compensated, and so on. And the Jews, on an incredible scale, Israel has been compensated for what Germany did to them during the Second World War. The only time when we have got any compensation, too, one is the, um, the Herero in Namibia. Very, very small compensation, disgracefully small, from the German government. And the second time, the, the, the Italians agreed to compensate the Libyans for what they had done in Libya in the 1920s or 1930s. And before they paid the money, all of them ganged up and, and mashed up Libya and brought down Gaddafi. They are international gangsters. They don't operate by law. They operate mm. by power, terrorism. That's right. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's another point here. I'll go through quickly. It's quite a few points. Um, there's a lot of projects that has no funds to help them get off the ground, so let's take, okay, reparation. So, um, and any money 
that we take for running projects won't be reparations. We pay taxes. We helped build and rebuild this country, both in enslavement, in colonialism, and since we came back here. Any money, any money that they take, give us for projects, is is what's owed to okay. us on a day to day basis. They're not reparation. Don't mix them up. And I'm okay. in favor of providing That's funds. An excellent come, answer. Providing the funds come without strings of taking the money to do our uh -huh. project. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. All right. Now there's another point here that I want to bring up. As we know that uh, for for this country, for Britain to end slavery, they had to compensate the slave owners yes. on an enormous scale. Yes. They went and borrowed some incredible amount of money. And a few years ago, it was discovered that it was only in 2015 that that money, that compensation was finished paid. Mm -hmm. So what that means, all of us sitting in this room who have lived and worked in this country would have been paying taxes to the government that would have been going to compensate those ex-slave master. Do you think there's a case for us all to lobby the Inland Revenue for tax rebates <laughs> against that? It'd be a nice little calculation. I, I, I mean, it's extremely important that we understand that that happened, that um, the, the British ruling class ripped off British taxpayers to pay their friends who owned enslaved people and who, who owned plantation. That is undoubtedly true. This whole heap of money it has been very fully um, studied by some, some white people at um, University of, of University yes. College London. Yeah. So the details are available, yeah. Yeah. available online. And it is true that since we've lived here, some of our taxes have gone, gone into that. But it's a minor um, <laughs> line of, of, of concern even though the money is a large amount. I'm, I'm not for spending any, any effort on that. Okay. Anybody else with anything? Because I've got something I want to say. It's a point I want to raise. It's very controversial, but it's deliberately controversial. We talked about the cultural revolution and changing things. Now, what we have witnessed recently from a group called Black Life Matters, we have seen mass mobilization. Now, and I would say not until Garvey, maybe the times of Garvey, have we seen mobilization in that kind of number and being so sustained. Do you think, and I say this will be controversial, Pan-Africanist organizations should seek some kind of working relationship with a group like that in order to start mobilizing, lobbying on a mass scale, embassies, countries, demonstration, make life hell for these people that they will be willing to sit down and have some kind of conversation with us. Um, let somebody else start off in answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've got views, but... Yeah, they're I said it different. was controversial. We first have to ask ourselves who are these Black Lives Matter people. Mm -hmm. Who's behind them? Because from what I know, they're not about building the African family. It's about promoting gay and lesbian. And that is not what we In fact, we have to look at who are the big money people and the publicity in which they receive. I remember when Britain and the IRA had their differences and they were waging war with each other. Margaret Thatcher said, we must choke off the accession of publicity to the terrorists. So when Sinn Féin have anything to say, no word was coming out of their mouth. Somebody beside them would say, what Sinn Féin say? Because the press publicity is very important um, in galvanizing people to what the issue is. So we've got to ask ourselves, how is it that these um, Black Lives Matter people are getting so much good press? And they're good, getting good press because their agenda is not ours. It's not about Pan-Africanism. It's not about redemption of us as African people. Um, that, is, that is not the view I take. 
there is truth in what Brother Pepekai says. But what he's talking about is a small group of people who um, organized themselves and, and registered the name Black Lives Matter in, the, in, in North America. In fact, um, what was happening in the moment when they registered Black Lives Matter is that there was a developing mass movement um, provoked and generated out of the police murder of a specific African-American in, in, in individual. Similarly, in the last few weeks, we saw the brother Floyd um, with a policeman with his um, knee on his neck for nine, nine minutes or, or, or thereabout. That outraged Africans and other people. Black Lives Matter didn't organize that. That was spontaneous self-organizing and in place after place, in order to understand the presence of those people on the street, you got to understand what local activists and local organizers who are not necessarily Black Lives Matter, even though the Black Lives Matter slogans appear in, 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 in those demos. And it's gone worldwide and it's provoked by the brutal racism of the United States state and its police forces and, 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 and so on. And it is right that people responded and, and that the response is still in place. A lot of it is spontaneous. Nobody really organized it. Um, but insofar as they organized it, frequently the organizers were not Black Lives Matter. More frequently than not, the organizers were not Black Lives Matter. And so, um, for example, nationalists who have a case against the registered Black Lives Matter people that they're promoting um, lesbianism rather than Pan-Africanism. The people who say that have a point. But it's important that we separate this mass movement from the people who have registered the name Black Lives Matter and are claiming own the movement. They don't own the movement. And this mass movement isn't theirs. Now, the other part of the question was what do Pan-Africanists do? Us Pan-Africanists have to relate to that mass movement out there. We have to understand that it may very well die down because it's a spontaneous movement. People run out of energy, they run out of enthusiasm and so on. The cold comes, the dogs come, the state comes. Trump is confronting it in the United States at the moment and threatening to confront it very brutally in order to make a right-wing racial response from which he will benefit politically. Whether that will work or not is another matter. But he's actually trying it right now as, 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 as we speak. So it's a complicated and interesting moment. And what we must do is write it off because we might have an argument against a narrow set of sisters who are using Black Lives Matter to promote the lesbian cause. Okay. I'm sorry, Sister Afrian is still there. You want to yeah, I mean, just just as like you know, as as you know, has been explained, the Black Lives Matter is a specific thing, you know, the movement, and it's only part of this global, you know, um, uprising that is happening now. It's not, it's not the owner, you know, or even in the forefront of it, you know. That was spontaneous, based on so much lynching, you know, mm -hmm. and um, oppression in the U.S. Now mm -hmm. we also need to careful that you can have a lot of momentum, a lot of action, you know, people are running around but actually nothing is happening really and that then becomes you know, the responsibility of Pan-Africanists you know, that how do we give these things direction? Because we can say, you know, like they say in the US oh, you know, we're against um, police oppression Okay, so now then the white supremacists say, okay, we'll defend the police station and, you know, we'll try and have good policemen. It's just a few, you know, what, how they say bad eggs or one bad eggs for lunch, this kind of nonsense. And black people will go back to sleep because apparently the matter has been solved. But we do not locate the problem historically as saying that the police started out as slave catchers. And that's what they are still doing till today playing the role of slave catchers. And that the Africans in the US are still trapped in a colony. Just like Africans on the continent, we are still in colonies here. But it's just that now, you know, the gatekeepers and those who lock us in are people who look like us. 
Whereas in the U.S., you know, those who lock them in are still, you know, the, the original slave catchers. For us to have that kind of historic understanding, you know, and deep revolutionary understanding of our situation. So, no, it's no use of saying, oh, God appeals to embassies and news. That's all nonsense. Dealing with embassies. Who, who do the embassies represent? They represent the same ruling class that, you know, oppresses us. The con I hope my voice isn't going in and out. So I'm saying that our work is way beyond Black Lives Matter. And of course, we know that, you know, Black Lives Matter, you know, they, they have a funder, you know, and, um, and, uh, and um, allegedly a public anonymous funder. <laughs> it's public, but it's anonymous, you know. So it, it's about what is the agenda. And the point we have to know as pan is that our agenda must be deeper, much, much deeper. Our, um, you know, not, not, not reformism, because that's what, you know, Black Lives Matter is about, reformism, you know, reforming, you know, getting better policemen, you know, defunding them. That's all reformism. But I'm not even in the business of attacking, you know, the agenda because, because every little helps, you know, like Tesco says, you know. But there has to be clarity on where we're going. And therefore, we need to occupy the space in terms of providing analysis, providing guidance, providing direction, you know, the way this struggle is being waged. Because you find out that sometimes Africans on the continent and think the issue of police killings has a diaspora because, by the way, the police, neo colonial police here also kill us, you know. But yes. the, the dynamics are slightly, you know, different, but it's ultimately for the same purpose. So, I think the point I'm making is that Pan Africanists have a much deeper role to play, a bigger role to play, and to um, expose, you know, the forces of reformism because you know that a lot of uh, the so called um, leaders in the communities, both you know, on the continent and especially in the diaspora are all they're just camera people you know you know once the camera is switched on then they pop up you know a lot of them actually work for the state a lot of them work you know for agendas that are inherently hostile to us so that's all i would say you know so we don't have to bash any other movement you know because everything is good in struggle but we need to provide clarity in our struggle yeah but Parker. yes okay well, there's quite a few, so I'll just highlight a few more points that's come in, and that's from uh, Barry yes. Marnie. I agree we require a cultural revolution that is that is spiritual and moral revolution. Ubuntu, to combat indoctrination so that physical revolution can succeed. So that, that's from Brother Marnie. Um, there's another comment here. Uh, didn't China locked out the West for a number of years? And didn't that allow them to know what was happening? Okay. So I'll just quickly go through some of these. As there's another point here, preparation is based on human rights violation. Super slow. Uh, okay. Why not by any means? Okay, yeah, so um, as we can see, there's a number of comments coming in. But getting back specifically to um, the question of reparation. So from what I'm taking from this, um, most of our people out there, as we said, got an um, idea when, when the word reparations is raised of they think in money monetary that's what that's what's motivating or put it that way that's the drive of most of these people who get involved with the re reparation movement it seems to be a monetary one only not the hope that someday maybe someday soon we will be compensated monetarily in a way. But from what I'm picking up from all of the most of the speakers is saying, until we can even think about that or start to pursue that, we first have to 
sort our minds out on ourselves. So the question is now, how deeply damaged do you think we are? There's a sister, I think it's Joy DeQuiri, talked about post-traumatic slavery syndrome. Degree, yeah. Meaning that we have damaged to an extent that it's going to take a lot to get us to a position or to get our minds into a position where we can uh, pursue reparation in a meaningful way. So what I'm saying, how, in terms of time scales and in terms of organizing and in terms of getting people together, how do you see the way forward in terms of bringing our people to a realization that they are mentally damaged, that 400 years have damaged us immensely because I don't think a lot of people have thought about something like that. They may think they're fine, but do you see a way forward in terms of <clears throat> us getting our minds um, prepared to pursue the ultimate goal of the reparations. I, I think I it don't would know if everybody understood what I was saying. Yes, I think it would be a big mistake to set about to persuade our people that we're mentally damaged. Of course, we went through enslavement and that's left um, scars, but I don't think we face an inherited um, trauma in the way that the sister who wrote that very interesting book has, has, has argued. At the end of enslavement in the United States of America, thousands and thousands of African men went into the army to fight for their liberation. Enslavement in the Caribbean, Africans um, in Haiti organized a miraculous 13 year war to liberate themselves. Something like that happened in Jamaica on smaller scale, 1831, uh, the Sam Sharp Emancipation Rebellion. Our people, and if you go and look at the literature, you see, for example, French stuff in Haiti talking about how brave the Africans were. This is long before the, 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 the revolution. So if we end enslavement capable of fighting for our liberation, how do we make the argument that we, 200 years later, we are facing an inherited trauma? I'm completely unconvinced about that. And the people who write these, book, these books, and in particular that book by that sister, which is an interesting and very influential book, completely forget that the key oppressive structures in the United States of America are not the ones in the enslavement period, but the ones, I've said this already in, in, in this session, are the ones that they experienced and were set up after enslavement. All of the lynching and all of that stuff is post-slavery. And if there is a syndrome, it's the post-slavery syndrome that has to be addressed. And if you go and look at African-American history, you see that frequently Africans who come out of another experience with enslavement in their background, the Garveys and all of those people, Winston James lists them in, 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 in a book of his that talks about Caribbean influence in the United States of, of, of America. We went there on the basis of a, a different post-slavery, ex, post-enslavement experience and were able to offer a kind of leadership, a kind of inspiration and so on and so on that couldn't have come out of um, that community because mm. of the way they had been terrorized into submission. All of these things have to be, be, be understood. And then we Africans have to remember that our liberation struggles aren't just in Haiti, aren't just in Jamaica in 1831. We just finished defeating the white people on the field of battle all over Africa. Um, Kenya, South Africa, Namibia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, etc. We won military victories against them. All of those regimes were supported from here. We have military capacity that under began suggested in those anti-colonial armed liberation struggles. The notion that we can't fight them um, is, is, a, is a, a nonsense that we must bury, right? This is not an argument for going into the street tomorrow, but it's an argument for knowing 
that we have an inherited cultural military capacity that is capable of defeating the enemy, who are not all that, you know, in our lifetime, we saw the Viet Vietnamese knock spots off the, off the Americans. Even in Iraq the other day, you know, they left, they didn't leave with their tail between their legs, but they were defeated by those people, right? And, and, and so the notion that we face an undefeatable enemy is a nonsense. And part of confronting this moment is to understand what we bring into it by way of cultural and spiritual and military um, in the sense of strategic, military strategic resources. So uh, in the last, say, five minutes, yeah, just uh, Brother Pepperdine. Okay. I don't know where but it says to get that argument from that any one of us is saying that the white man is so powerful and we no, can't fight him. I don't think you're saying that, no. I wasn't arguing against you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But when I was a boy going to school, there was something about, uh, I can't remember what it was, but we were supposed to dress up. Um, in some character um, of our choice. And I remember I went to school with a cowboy hat, gun belt, you know. And that was me. Mm -hmm. If you mention anything about Africa, I wouldn't be in favor of joining you in anything to do with Africa. Because from my concept that been fed into me, that these are jungle people, with bone in the nose, spear in the hand, running, uh, and I didn't want to be associated with them at all. In fact, I remember the books that I used to read at school. This is Sambo. His mother is Mambo. His father is Fambo. And they live in the jungle. And that book was printed by Langman and Macmillan and what have you. And I believe the same publisher have a book in Africa and saying, this is Trevor, sugarcane eater, sons and daughters of slaves. And the African and the content didn't want to have anything to do with Trevor. I remember too, when I was at school and the teacher was having a geography lesson. And she said, she mentioned monster rat. And all of us, we were up with laughter. And we said, oh, the Nyam rat down there. And the teacher never said to us, oh, listen, these people are just like you in Jamaica. They originally come from Africa. They were positive as slaves. They've been brutalized. They've been abused, blah, blah, blah. And they are your brothers and sisters. No, teacher never said that. She laughed with us and then tell us, how wonderful and glorified Europe was. She said, in the manufacture of cars, motor cars, they put all the bits in one machine and roll out a finished car. And we believe her. And that was a damn stupid lie. Nothing like that happened. The best that happened is that they have robots, and which is quite recently, that take a lot of the labor work that human beings used to do. But there's never a time when you throw all the bits in one machine and they roll out. Not like you're making candy or some biscuit or food is like that. And that is what we've been told. So that is the point I'm saying. The colonial mentality, the slave mentality that robs us of our sense of who we are, our sense of confidence, our sense of being in the world. I've seen people in Jamaica where I was born and raised. So you're too black and ugly. You do this, you do that. Everything about our Africanness was was um a this. What does that say about our minds? So I think that we have to critically look at this idea that the sister put in um her book. And I wouldn't be I wouldn't be the first 
rubbish it at all. I would have to look at it, scrutinize it, and I'm saying fundamentally there's truth in what she said. Maybe she hasn't looked at all the angles, but that's where we need to start from. And when we talk about book, being a bookseller myself, I would strongly recommend the reading of the ISIS papers by Francis West Wilson, because that begins to look at it from a psychological point of view. Why do we do to ourselves the things that we do? And why do we allow other people to do to us? And we hate them in the process. So I'm saying in closing that we need to reconnect with ourselves. We have to understand that we as a people have our way of seeing the world and our place in the world. And that has been changed. We're literally walking on our heads instead of walking on our feet. We are crouching on our backs and a lot of people to ride on our backs. I want you to stand up and throw them off. And we can only do that when we begin to understand our history, our culture, our values, and return to them. Now we can't return to them as they were practiced in totality because time has changed and some of what we're doing were not in our best interest either. So we have to be very careful. But one thing we should not do is to throw away the baby with the bathwater. We need to examine very carefully what is good and the best of our tradition and culture and we need to return to them. For example, we need to put Christianity and Islam in the dustbin. We don't need it. It has done us no good and will never do us any good. We don't need it. We must return to African spirituality and the best part of it, because not all of it is worth returning to. We need to be critical in terms of our station. All right. And just finally, oh. my brothers just put a book in my hand by a um, man we've been talking about. Decolonizing the African mind is where we start. Yeah, I mean, we're coming to the end. It's a pretty shame. Oh, I just wanted to talk to um, Sister Afia and she just dropped out man, again. Man. Wait, wait, hold on a bit. Wait a minute, sister, just before. Uh, Sister Afian, she just dropped out again because buried in mind she's coming through from Nigeria and the line isn't that yeah. good. So if she comes back on, I'm going to go straight to her just to give her a chance yeah. to um to 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 wind up. But in the last few minutes, we got the question that was asked on the flyer was reparation, request or demand. You know, so in our winding up, but just before I say that um, the Brother Sabella from South Africa, he posted, I'll just put it up again, which is interesting. He's saying that this trauma has been going on for more than 400 years. It dates back to the seventh century. That's when the Arab invaded Africa. He <coughs> believes that we have been suffering in some way from this gross slave uh, traumatic syndrome. Join the guy called so, the theory. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so, um, Okay, Brother Cecil, so this should be like the final winding up comments. And if Sister Appian comes in, I'm just going to jump straight to her to give her a chance yes, to I, I understand and uh, wind up as well. I believe that you should do that. Mm -hmm. Right. Let me just say that I'm not a believer in the um, slave um, syndrome in the way that is argued in that famous book by, by, by the sister. I want to say one other thing. Brother Peppercai and myself come out of identical Caribbean Jamaican background, right? Identical. Um, and what all of what he just said was in my background as well. What else was there? What else was there was um, Sparrow denouncing that film derived attitude to Africans and other um, popular culture. What else was there was the development of Rastafari. What else was there was popular Garveyism. What else was there was a whole set of religious expressions and experiences that were 
fundamentally African in, in, in their nature. So our people, um, while subjected to all of the horrors, including the intellectual and mental horrors of colonialism and late colonialism, which is the, the moment in which we grew up in, in Jamaica, also had the capacity to challenge that. And inside of that space, all kinds of challenges um, were there, including the one presented by Rastafari, presented by Garvey, presented by the best of our popular music and so on. People should listen to Sparrow, and not just late Sparrow, early Sparrow, when, he, when he's criticizing Tarzan and he's criticizing the, um, the, 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 the racist books that tell us all the foolishness about how cow jump over, over moon and, 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 and so on. So it's very important that we understand that the cultural situation, the situation of oppression through which we went was actually much more complicated than we than 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 we we tend to represent it as, and that we know that there was resistance and resistance of all kinds, cultural, um, spiritual, <clears throat> and physical resistance to that stuff. Okay. And, and where reparations is concerned, um, the point that Afiong made about the importance of taking the story of what is owed to us, to, to the, the masses of the African people, is, is an extremely important task. The business of, um, of, of, of self-repair, but not self-repair as a psychological exercise, but self-repair as a practical, revolutionary, self-construction, liberation, um, unification exercise, fully 100% in, in, in favor of that. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, unfortunately, Sister Afian hasn't managed to get back in so far. So, and we, we've gone way over our time today, but it's well worth it. Um, so, Brother Pepper Kai, again, the question was reparation. Um, a request or demand. So what um, what position do you think we are in, in terms of that, just to wind up? As, as my brother, sister, and sister Afian have made it clear, it's a just demand, but weak people cannot make demand of strong people. We have to organize ourselves, we have to empower ourselves, and we can start from today. And from today, we have to reach out to each other and build a reparation movement. That reparation movement has to start where we are locally, it has to go nationally, and we have to connect globally. And when the last point he made is crucial. It is no point that we in the diaspora is campaigning for reparation, and our brothers and sisters in the country don't know what we're campaigning about. We have to connect with each other. We have to educate each other. We have to move with each other. And only an, a global reparation movement that seek to empower us as Africans, to equip us with what it takes to get the reparation we want. Only then can we say, that to make a demand. We first have to equip ourselves and we have to be disciplined about it. And we cannot do it without strengthening and building our organization. Because the organization we have globally, they're fragile, they're brittle, they're tiny, they're small. And we must get away from this nonsense about small is beautiful. We need to be big and powerful. Yeah, that's unfortunately no Afian. But just one point, I mean, that point was crucial about um, engaging with um, brothers and sisters on the continent, mm -hmm. because obviously their outlook and our outlook is totally different when it comes to reparations. So how can we tie up the two? Um, there was a case when um, way back, you had a brother in Nigeria, Chief Abiola, got involved in the, re in, the, in the reparation argument. I think he um, linked up with Bernie Grant at the time from yeah. this country. 
Now, I don't know if Brother Cecil, if you know anything about that, just to finish, just to enlighten us a little bit in terms of what was the approach um, to that union. Okay, the, um, I'm, I'm not a complete expert on it, but it's a fact that um, an African chief with money um, accepted the legitimacy of the, Af the international African claim for reparations against certainly the predators from the sea, i.e. the white people from, from, from the West. I don't remember what his position was on um, the other um, extractor, the predators from the desert, Arab Islam. But in respect of reparations, uh, reparations claim against the West, he organized with his own money in 1993, a reparations conference, the first Pan-African reparations conference happened at Abuja in Nigeria. Um, people from here, including Bernie, Bernie Grant, including also the white um, Lord Gifford, um, who on one level is a big reparationist and makes all the right noises about reparations. But when you know what he's saying in private, he, for example, agreed with the, with the Lee Day statement that it, it, it's impossible to, to win it at law uh, a case of reparations for, for, for enslavement. Gifford is actually on record in a paper criticizing Lee Day, and he criticizes the Lee Day, um, the, 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 the Lee Day approach, accepting that he says right at the start, I agree with them when they say that it's impossible to win legally uh, a claim for, for reparations for, for, for enslavement. So um, the, the documents from that Abuja conference may well be available online. People should probably Google Abuja Reparations Conference or first Pan-African Reparations Conference Abuja 1993, um, and all of the material might well come up there. Um, the paper from which our brother um, assisting Elder Pepekai read is one of the papers that was presented at that um, at that conference. Um, the the OAU went on formally to adopt the position that was arrived at in Abuja, and then in two thousand and one at at um, in South Africa at Durban, they they proceeded to undermine it because. Uh, the, the West was keen to achieve a separation between the position around reparations that was being put by the diaspora, and they got the African states to, to accept that you didn't have to put no reparations argument because they were willing to offer debt relief. And the African states went down the debt relief line 19 years later, they are just as much in debt as, as they ever were because the debt relief is also a trick. And the trick has long been exposed because they keep borrowing and wasting and, 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 and so on and so forth. But that's briefly the story of, of the um, Abuja um, mm. uh, <clears throat> reparations event. We can one Sunday we can look at it uh, in, in one Sunday we yeah, can look yeah, at it. Yeah, yeah, we the most. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Definitely. That's I just would like to add a little bit to what Brother Sis said about um Abiola and um Okay. And um Bernie Grant. Bernie Grant. Bernie Grant was a British MP. Yes. Fully committed to the grassroots, a radical um MP. It wasn't about a career MP. He was committed. I agree with that. And when you link him to Abiola, who was to become the president of Nigeria, mm -hmm. that's a dangerous mix for Western um, gangsters. And he died in prison, they murdered him in prison. Yes. Now, I don't know what Bernie Grant died from, but he died soon after. So read the story. Yes. Okay. I, I agree with the judgment of, of, of Bernie. Who was uncompromising and committed to the people? Yes. Okay. Okay, then. Thanks. <laughs> we have come again, once again, come to the end. But I'd like to thank everybody who's tuned in today. And uh, 
Yeah, so from next week, we are entering August. So August is the month that we'll be concentrating on Garvey. We'll be doing uh, several things around Garvey. So next week on the 1st, which is this Saturday, we'll be having um, Professor Kimani Nawusi, and he'll be starting the whole month rolling for us. And um, so keep a check of this channel. It will be a lecture coming. I mean, he's based in the States. So we'll be starting, I think it's 8 p.m. on the Saturday. And he'll be looking at libation and deliberation. And then on the Sunday, Elder Cecil will be back leading a panel. We'll be looking at the founding of the Organization of African Unity, the OAU. And um, we'll be having a panel to look at that, which we touched on today. And it's a very important thing to show um, just how those institutions came about and what role did they play and everything. So until next week, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning into this channel. And again, please, if you're new to this channel, oh, Safian's just back. Yes, it's Safian. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> oh, we were just winding up and it just came in time. So this what we'll... This, oh, I've, I've been out yeah, all this, this time, but I was thinking that this is neocolonialism in action. But what was the latest question? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just um, we, we're just now winding up. So it was just a summary. A summary. I said that the um, initial title for this today was reparations, uh, requests or demand. So we were just looking at it from that point of view, just to wind up. So you can just say um, a few words, just what you thought of today and how it went, and just to give us, uh, you know, a summary. Well, I think if we're serious in going forward, you know, we must have clarity about, you know, like, you know, Fanon's eternal question, what is the mission of this generation? And so we've all got to be able to answer that question, because the mission of the generation of the 20th century was to defeat colonialism. And they did it. You know, colonialism was defeated. You know, so now what is the mission of this our generation? What is the mission of us as Africans in the twenty-first century? And for us in Moyo Wataifa, we've always said that, you know, our own mission is to identify and defeat neocolonialism. Now, if we say that, you know, then people need to go and do their own manifest. How does it affect, you know, so that we have that understanding um, and, you know, begin to put that kind of kind of work in place. One of the, 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 the one question of that confronts well, it's not a question, but it's a solution. You know, one of the main solutions, or maybe the key solution, is the question of African unity. And of course, that ties in directly with the question of defeating neocolonialism. You know, it's the question of attempting to your African unity in this generation. You know, this is one of the key comedy from the position of our states or our neocolonial countries. It's going to be the African unity of Africans in the diaspora with their institutions, with their organizations, with types of institutions, organizations, communities, you know, uh, agencies, you know, with Africans on the continent and vice versa. You know, so first of all, we would need the kind of understanding that Gavi had. We are all Africans globally, regardless of our location, and that our motherland is our home base. You know, and, and to have that understanding deep in our minds. And to begin to 
Yeah, unfortunately, we're having quite a bit of problem mm. with the line. But um, please, oh. please ask our sister to join us again next week. Be really good to have her. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, it does. Well, if you're listening, Sister Afi, and I'll get in touch with you later anyway about next week um, discussion about the A O A U the formation, and she mentioned uh, just to wind up last word, just to mention uh, like she did mention about African unity, and it's important to focus on that because when a lot of people say African unity, sometimes people in the diaspora, especially the old diaspora who descendants of the um, ones who was kidnapped thinking it, they think they have a tendency to think, well, that excludes us. But there is such a thing as a sixth region, which is supposed to encompass us. So that's some time down, uh, down the line. I would like to actually do a, um, a session looking specifically at the sixth union, just to let people know what, what that's all about and how we are included within that. So again, um, just wind up again, so I'd like to thank everybody for watching again PSM TV, and we'll see you all next week at first on the Saturday, remember, Saturday the 1st at 8 p.m. with Professor Kaman in Ohusi, looking at libation and liberation. And then on Sunday, we have a panel led by Elder um, uh, Cecil, looking at the founding of the organization of African unity. So until next week, I bid you all farewell. Love you now.